Hello, I'm William Michael of the Classical Liberal Arts Academy, and in this video I'd like to walk students through uh, another part of the first lesson of the Classical Liberal Arts Academy's Greek Grammar 1 course. Uh, in our first video, we studied the Greek alphabet. We learned the, the names of the 24 letters in the Greek alphabet. We learned how they're formed in writing in uppercase and lowercase forms. And we also learned their sounds, how they're pronounced. We learned that Greek orthography is very simple because each letter signifies just one sound. Um, so it's very easy to learn to read and write the Greek language once we're able to identify the letters and their sounds. In this second video, we're going to go a little further into detail in the study of Greek orthography, the study of the Greek letters and sounds. Now, um, most Greek grammar teachers, Greek grammar courses, will ignore lessons like the one that I'm going to walk through in, in this video, lessons that uh, the old grammar teachers obviously taught when they introduced students to uh, Greek grammar. Often modern teachers don't get into these things because either they don't understand them or they don't think that they're useful. But the reason why they don't think that they're useful is usually because they don't get far enough into the study of Greek etymology or the study of, of Greek grammar as regards the forms and meaning of the parts of speech to understand why these lessons in orthography are actually so important and helpful to students. So I'm going to walk through this lesson in orthography from Gretzer's Greek grammar. And then as we study through the rules of Greek etymology, I'll be sure to go back and explain how those rules make sense because of the lessons we learn in Greek orthography and really how they, how they make sense in light of one concept in particular, which I'll talk about later on. So at this point in your Greek studies, you should be very comfortable naming all of the Greek letters in uppercase and lowercase forms. You should be able to read and pronounce the Greek letters correctly, and you should be able to write any Greek figure. If you're given the name of a letter, you should be able to write the uppercase and lowercase form. If you can't do that yet, you're jumping prematurely into this lesson. You should take more time on that first part of the lesson and master the Greek alphabet. It's, it's very important in the study of Greek. And if you don't, you're just going to you know, delay yourself and hinder yourself from being able to advance because you're always going to be uncertain about the letters. So take your time, master the Greek alphabet, and then when you've got that pretty well mastered and you feel comfortable with it, come on up and, and continue these orthography studies in this second video. So um, what we're going to do is talk about more of the characteristics of the Greek alphabet and the letters. Um, as I said, this can appear pretty boring and abstract when you're just getting started, but later when we learn grammar rules in etymology, the rules are going to seem random and not make much sense unless you know these points in orthography. So pay attention, learn what this old grammarian, Jacob Gretzer, took pains to teach, and which I'm going to go through with you, and later on you'll see the benefits. So let's go ahead and get started. One last warning before we go is remember that the, the original text of Gretzer's Greek grammar is written in Latin, so um, I'll read the Latin as we go, translate it into English, and then show you what he's saying as we go through this lesson. All right, so. In this second video, we're going to talk about the divisions of the Greek letters and the different characteristics of these different groups of Greek letters, a study that, that can be very helpful in the future. So the lesson starts, and Gretzer writes, Dividuntor litere generali divisione in vocales et consonantes. Dividuntor litere generali divisione in vocales et consonantes. And what that says is um, 
the Latin, uh, the Greek letters are divided by a general division or with a general division into vowels and consonants. The letters are divided, generally speaking, into vowels and consonants. And you can see that I've got these two groups up here on the board. Vowels, vocales, et consonantes, vowels and consonants. So two general divisions of the letters of the Greek alphabet. Uh, vocales, how many are they? The lesson says, vocales sunt septem. Vocales sunt septem. That means the vowels are seven. And here we see a list of the seven Greek vowels. Note that they're not in alphabetical order. Okay, they're, they're arranged according to the groups that we're going to learn about. They're not in the, the order that they appear in the alphabet. The Greek vowels are seven in number. And we see the seven listed here, but they divide into three different groups. So there are three groups of the seven Latin vowels. Um, vocales natura longe sunt eta and omega. The vowels which by nature are long. So the long vowels, vowels that by their nature are long, are the vowels eta and omega. Eta and omega are always long in Greek because they're long by nature. Okay? The second group, the breves, the breves, epsilon and omicron. Breves means short. Epsilon and omicron are always short because they're short by nature. Epsilon, omicron. The short vowels. And then these three vowels, alpha, iota, and upsilon, are called dubiae or ancipites which means doubtful or uncertain. What it really means is they can be either long or short, depending on the words and the syllables that they're used in. So eta and omega are always long. Epsilon and omicron are always short. And the other vowels, alpha, iota, and upsilon, the other vowels can be long or short. You'll have to learn in each individual word. So what's easy to, to remember is just there are two long vowels, two short vowels, pretty easy to remember. The rest are doubtful. It depends on the word, all right? Seven vowels, three groups, long, short, and doubtful. The long vowels are eta and omega. The short vowels are epsilon and omicron, and notice that these correspond, e and e, same sound, different length, o and o, same sound, different length. So these correspond to one another. These are the long sounds, these are the short sounds, these sounds can be long or short in different words, okay? That's the division of the vowels. In the next section, we study diphthongi, the diphthongs, the Greek diphthongs. And we have a list, and we learn in this lesson in Gretzer's Greek that there are 12 Greek diphthongs, and I've listed them on the board here. All of these six and all of these six, 12 in all. The textbook says, <clears throat> Construuntor ex vocalibus diphthongi duo decim. Construuntor ex vocalibus diphthongi duo decim. And what that says is 12 diphthongs are constructed out of the vowels. 12 diphthongs are formed out of the vowels. And we have those 12 diphthongs listed here. It says, quarum sex vocantor proprie. 
quorum six vocantur propriae, of which six, these six on the top, are called proper or true diphthongs. The proper diphthongs are six, and the improper diphthongs are also six in number. So there are 12 diphthongs in all in Greek. Six of them are called proper or true diphthongs. The other six are called improper diphthongs. Okay? Now he goes on to explain what proper and improper diphthongs are, and I'll read it uh, briefly just to give you a gist of it. Ile dicuntur propriae quod duplicem edant sonum si recte pronuntientur. What that means is those diphthongs are called proper or true, which, when rightly pronounced, include the sounds of both vowels. The idea of a diphthong is that two separate vowel sounds come together in one syllable, but both sounds can be heard in what's sort of a double vowel sound, but it's only one syllable. So for these to be proper diphthongs, it means that two vowels come together in one syllable, and when we pronounce this diphthong rightly, we can hear both of those vowel sounds in that one syllable. Okay, so for alpha yota, it's pronounced I, a, e, I, one syllable, I. We can hear both of those vowel sounds in one syllable. That's a proper diphthong. A, u, a, u, au, au, proper diphthong. We can hear both sounds in one syllable. E, i, e, i, e, 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 proper diphthong. We hear both sounds in one syllable. E, u, e, u, eu, 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 proper diphthong. O, e, o, e, together, oi, 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 one syllable, two vowel sounds. And lastly, o, u, o, u, o, 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 two vowel sounds in one syllable. It's worth noting, just to avoid confusion, that in many modern Greek textbooks, students will be taught to read this as oo, oo. But that's not, that's not a proper diphthong because the two vowel sounds are not spoken. So it's better to stick with the old grammar books and realize that the reason why omicron upsilon is listed with the proper diphthongs is because both sounds should be heard in that diphthong. So, when we have a diphthong where two vowel sounds come together in one syllable and both of those vowel sounds can be heard in that syllable, we have proper diphthongs, okay? Six proper diphthongs. Now, the other six diphthongs are called improper diphthongs. Improper diphthongs, because they're not true diphthongs. Yet, because they consist of two vowels, and we'll see two vowels written in one syllable, they are technically diphthongs, two vowels in one syllable. But they're not proper diphthongs, because when we read these pairs of vowels, we don't hear both vowel sounds, okay? What we have here is a set of three vowels, alpha, eta, and omega. Alpha, eta, and omega. And what we really have is the vowel alpha followed by yota. The vowel eta followed by yota. And the vowel omega followed by yota. But the yotas are not pronounced. The yotas are not pronounced. And so... While they're not, so in order to mark that they're not pronounced, they're moved from the end of the syllable and they're written as what's called a subscript. 
So this is called iota subscript. Iota subscript. I'll write it up here. Iota subscript. Iota subscript. A small iota moved from the end of the syllable down under that first vowel. When we read these three improper diphthongs, we simply ignore that yota. We just pronounce the first vowel. So alpha with yota subscript is read as a. Ah. We simply ignore the yota. Eta with yota subscript is read as a. E. We ignore the yota. And omega with yota subscript is read as o. We ignore the yota. So these are technically diphthongs, but they're improper diphthongs because we don't pronounce both vowel sounds when we pronounce these diphthongs. Okay? So that's what makes these improper diphthongs. Both sounds are not spoken. So we have six proper diphthongs, and so far we have three improper diphthongs. The reason why these are improper is because the yota subscript is not pronounced when we read these diphthongs, okay? Now there's three more improper diphthongs, eta, upsilon, upsilon, yota, and omega, upsilon. These three are also called improper diphthongs. Now, they're not called improper diphthongs because we only pronounce one of the vowels. That's not why these are called improper diphthongs. These three are called improper diphthongs because of a concept A concept called cacophony. Cacophony. Cacophony, it's actually written with kappas in Greek, but cacophony is the opposite of euphony. Euphony is the simple concept that language sounds pleasant. Euphonic means the language sounds pleasant pleasant. So if you're reading and there's a certain phrase or even word that you read and you say, I like that word. That word just sounds nice. Or, or listen to this sentence. This sentence or this line of poetry, it sounds pleasant. That's called euphony. You means good. And the phony comes from the Greek phonos, which means sound. Euphonic means sounding good. The opposite of that is cacophonous, which means sounding bad. The reason why these three diphthongs are listed as improper diphthongs is simply because they don't sound nice. That's why they're listed as improper diphthongs. They don't sound nice. Here we have the long eta followed by the upsilon, eu. It's not a pleasant sounding pair of vowels. Here we have the upsilon followed by the iota, ui, ui, if pronounced correctly. It doesn't sound nice. And then lastly, the omega followed by the upsilon, oi, oi. So you can see these three diphthongs, and they are diphthongs because it's two vowels in one syllable. And we do articulate both of the sounds, but because they don't sound nice, they're listed as improper diphthongs. Okay, so 12 diphthongs in Greek, 12 diphthongs, 12 pairs of vowels that will be found in a single syllable. That's what a diphthong is. Two vowels in one syllable. 
there are 12 such pairs of vowels called diphthongs. Six of them are called proper or true diphthongs. Six of them are called improper diphthongs. The first three are improper because the yotas are not pronounced. The last three are not proper because they just don't sound nice because of the question of euphony or cacophony. Okay? So that's for, uh, that's what Gretzer has to say about the diphthongs. All right? Know how many they are, know what they are, know how each of them is pronounced, and understand the difference between proper and improper diphthongs. And that's all we study um, regarding the Greek vowels. There's one other concept that's introduced that's, that's important. Um, let me see if he gives us an example that I can share with you. <clears throat> he writes, and this is the Latin from Gretzer's Greek, he writes, Quando vocalis posterior diphthongi duobus superne punctis notator tunc fit dieresis dieresis et quelibet vocales propriam syllabam constituit. And he gives us an example of the Greek word pais. Now, if we saw this word Pais in Greek, P alpha iota sigma, and here's an example of a final sigma as we learned in the last lesson. Pais, it would look like this is a one syllable word with a diphthong in the center, the diphthong alpha iota right here. It would look like a one syllable word with a diphthong alpha iota but it's not. This is actually a two-syllable word. And alpha yota in this word is not a diphthong. And so there's a certain way to mark the second vowel in what would be a diphthong to show that it's not a diphthong. And it's with two dots placed above the vowel. And it's called diaresis, diaresis. So, if I place two dots, like this, above the yota, those two dots, that's called diaresis. And what that tells us is that this yota does not form a diphthong with this alpha, but they're to be read as two vowels in separate syllables. Okay? That's what that... Um, symbol of the two dots above a vowel means. So this is not pais, pais, it's not a one syllable word with a diphthong, it's two syllables. There's a division between these two vowels and we would read, it, read this word correctly in two syllables as pais, pais, pais. Um, he gives us another example here. Let me see. <laughs> yeah, ironically, the word euphonos, euphonos. I'm not sure if you can read all this, but it doesn't matter. Euphonos. A euphonos, a euphonos, normally epsilon, upsilon would be a diphthong. But in the word a euphonos, which is euphony, the word I just talked about, a euphonos, this is not a diphthong because the upsilon is marked by diaresis. Okay, so the epsilon and the upsilon are not forming a diphthong in this word, and this is to be read with two syllables, not as euphonos, but as euphonos, 
E u phonos, two syllables. E u phonos. All right? That's marked by diaresis, the two dots above the second vowel. So that's just a note that's made to clarify something that relates to diphthongs because sometimes vowels are joined together that could form diphthongs, but they actually don't. And we're to understand that they need to be read as two separate syllables. Okay, so diphthongs and diaresis, and let me just write this word. The word is D-I-A-E-R-E-S-I-S, -E diaresis, and I'll put that in parentheses. So we have diphthongs, two vowel sounds pronounced in one syllable, but diaresis is the use of two dots written above the second vowel to show that that vowel does not form a diphthong with the vowel going before it, okay? That's all for vowels uh, in this lesson, for the orthography, the details of the vowels that Gretzer discusses. So we learned that there are seven vowels that divide into three groups, long, short, and doubtful. We learned that there are 12 diphthongs. Six of them are proper. Six of them are improper. Three are improper because the second vowel is not articulated and three are improper because they are cacophonous. They just sound ugly. And so they're not considered proper diphthongs. All right, that's all for vowels in this lesson. In the next part of the lesson, we study the division of the consonants and the different characteristics of consonants in Greek. And we'll keep going here. Uh, looks like we're about 27 minutes in, so I'll just keep going. The second part on, on consonants, de consonantibus. Consonantes sunt duplices, mute et semivocales. Consonantes sun, sunt duplices, mute and semivocales. So the division of consonants is double. There are two divisions of consonants, mute, which means mutes, and semi vocales. Mutes means that these are consonants that make no sound by themselves. They are mute. They are silent. Um, that doesn't mean that they, they don't make any sound like a silent letter. Um, it means that by themselves, they cannot make a sound unless they're joined with a vowel. Semivocales means sort of half vowels. They're almost vowels semi-vocales. So we have mute and semi-vocales. These are the two divisions of the consonants in Greek. Now, here's where this orthography lesson gets very important. What we see here is that there are nine mutes. Nine of the Greek consonants are called mutes. P, kappa, Tau, beta, gamma, delta, phi, chi, and theta. These are the nine mutes in Greek. But they're very easy to learn because they're all related and they correspond to one another. Pay attention to this because this is what's important in this orthography lesson. We have here the tenues, mute tenues, the simple mutes, simple tenues. P, kappa, and tau. And what I want you to think about are the sounds of these three consonants. P makes the simple P sound, just the popping of the lips. Kappa makes the simple sound. Just a click in the throat. And tau makes the simple dental sound. Be careful you don't add more to them. The P is just the popping of the lips. 
The kappa is uh, the sound made in the back of the throat, clicking. And the tal is the ticking of the teeth and the tongue. See that there are three simple sounds. Three simple sounds. Okay, the sound of the P, the sound of the kappa, and the sound of the tau. Three simple mute sounds. All right, now, when we move to the second set of mutes, we have to add something to those three simple sounds. We're going to add something. And when we add this, we make three different consonant sounds, okay? Those that are called medias or middles. But it would be better for us to call these voiced. Voiced mutes. And think about it. When I say voice, what I mean is we're going to add the humming of our vocal cords. Mm, voice. We're going to add voice to the simple mutes. And when we add voice to the simple mutes, we're going to produce the middle mutes or the voiced mutes. Okay? It's very simple. If you know these three simple sounds, we simply add voice to them and we produce these three other consonants. All right? So if we take the simple popping of the lips, but we add to it voice, we then have b, b, b. We have the sound of the consonant beta, b, b. It's p plus voice makes beta, b, b. Okay? If we take the kappa, the simple clicking of the kappa, and add voice to it, we now have the sound of the Greek letter gamma. The simple clicking plus voice makes g, 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 gamma. Kappa plus voice makes gamma, g. And then lastly, the simple sound of the tau, the ticking of the tau, t, 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 plus voice makes d, 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 the sound of the delta. All right? So when we take the simple mutes and add voice, we make the middle mutes, beta, gamma, and delta. All right? So we can see where these Greek letters and sounds come from. These are the simple mutes. These are the basic sounds of the language. These are a more complex sound built upon these simple mute consonant sounds. Now, if we add a different action, we produce a different set of consonants. What we're going to add for this third set is breath or aspiration. And that's why these are called aspirates or aspirated mutes. Aspirated. Because we're taking the simple mutes, P, Kappa, and Tau, and instead of voice, we're adding aspiration or rough breath, rough breathing. If we take the sound of the simple the popping of the lips of P and we add a rough breath, we add aspiration, we get the sound pa, 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 popping of the lips with aspiration. Pa, pa. That's why in the first lesson I explained that the true pronunciation of this letter is actually Okay? But normally, just for laziness sake, we say fi. We make it simpler for the sake of ease. But the correct pronunciation is pi, pi. All right? 
Second, if we take the simple mute kappa, kappa, which is made with the clicking sound in our throat, and we add breath to it, we come to the sound ka, ka, ka. And that's the sound signified by the Greek letter ki, ki, okay? And then lastly, if we take the sound of the simple mute tau, t -t 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 tau, and add aspiration, we make And that's why I taught you that the true pronunciation of the letter theta is like Thomas in English, th, ta, ta, ta. It's because it's a tau plus aspiration. That's the actual significance of this letter. And so we have the aspirated mutes. So we have nine mutes. Three simple mutes, three voiced mutes, and three aspirated mutes. All right? So if you start with the three simple mutes and just add voice to each one of them, you produce the three voiced mutes. And if you add aspiration to these three simple mutes, you get the aspirated mutes. And what's important to see is that these nine letters, the P, the Beta, and the P, the Kappa, the Gamma, and the Ki, the Tau, the Delta, and the Theta are related to one another. Okay? The voiced consonants simply add voice to these simple mutes, the aspirated consonants add aspiration to these simple mutes. Now, why this is important, why this is important in Greek, is because later on, as we study the forms of Greek words, we're going to see that all kinds of changes take place when different pieces of words are joined together. Sometimes there are contractions, some letters are dropped, some letters are changed, and for most students studying the Greek language, they simply have to memorize those changes, and they call them irregular forms. But when you understand the orthography, and you understand the concept that I mentioned before of euphony, sounding good, you can understand why the changes take place. And it's not irregular. It's actually regular and reasonable. You just have to understand how the Greek letters were truly pronounced and how that pronunciation, that true orthography, caused changes to be necessary because of how the letters and sounds related to one another and because we're always concerned with things sounding good. Okay, we're concerned with euphony. We'd like to avoid cacophony. Okay, if you understand these ideas from orthography and you learn these things rightly, which, again, most Greek courses don't teach these things, you don't have to memorize rules in the dark and just believe that there's all sorts of confusion and irregularity in the language rules. You can understand why the changes actually take place, and it can all be reasonable. All right? That's why these lessons are very important in the future. And like I said, when we get to those rules in etymology, I'll take time to show you how those rules relate back to what we learned in Greek orthography. Okay? So that's what Gretzer teaches us about the mutes. Very important and helpful lesson in Greek orthography. The second division of consonants is semivocales. And like I said before, they're like half vowels or almost vowels. Um, we have four semivowels that are called liquids. Liquids. Gretzer says 
that they're also called immutables, unchangeables. Okay? Lambda, mu, nu, and rho. These are the four liquid semi vocales because they can be articulated because they're almost vowels, unlike the mutes, which cannot be articulated without being joined to a vowel. These can almost be articulated without a vowel. Lambda, l, l, mu, m, nu, n, and ro, r. These are the liquids, okay? The liquid semivowels. The second group of semivowels are called duplices. Duplices, or double consonants. They're double consonants simply because they combine the sound of two different consonants into one double consonant. The first double semivowel is the zeta which combines the sound of delta and sigma. So the zeta, um, I should put a final s, the zeta basically makes the sound of delta and sigma together. Z, z, z. Okay, that's the zeta, a double consonant, makes the sound of delta and sigma together. The second double semivowel is xi. The letter xi makes the sound of the letters kappa and sigma. X, x. Those two consonant sounds are joined together in the double semivowel xi. And then lastly, psi. Psi makes the sound of the combined consonants P and sigma. Psi, the double semivowel. Psi, P and sigma. Ps, ps. All right, so these three double consonants, three semi vocales. And then lastly, there's one last consonant floating in isolation, and that's the letter sigma. The letter sigma. Okay, so that's an overview of the divisions of the letters of the Greek alphabet according to their different qualities or properties. All right, we have the general division of all 24 of the Greek letters, the general division into vowels and consonants. Then we have the division of vowels into long, short, and doubtful vowels. Long, eta, and omega, short, epsilon, omicron, the rest are doubtful. That's the easy way to remember it. We learned that there are 12 diphthongs. You should know what a diphthong is. A diphthong is two vowels in one syllable. We learned that there are six proper diphthongs, six improper diphthongs, three in which only one vowel is articulated, three which are cacophonous and therefore are called improper. We learned what diaresis is. Diaresis is the use of two dots written above the second vowel in a pair of vowels that could be read as a diphthong, but should not be. Diaresis, I think in English it's pronounced diaresis. Okay, you can check that. But in Greek it's diaresis. Diaresis is used to show that two vowels are to be read as two distinct uh, syllables, okay? So that's all for the vowels. Then we learn that the consonants are also divided into two classes, mutes and semivowels. There are nine mutes, but they all relate to three simple mute sounds. The three simple mute sounds, P, Kappa, and Tau, 
the three voiced mutes, beta, gamma, and delta, and the three aspirated mutes, phi, key, and theta, to use the modern pronunciation. Then the semivocals, or almost vowels, lambda, mu, nu, and rho, are called liquids. The duplices, or double consonants, zeta, xi, and psi, and lastly, the consonant sigma. All right, so uh, that's everything that Gretzer has to say about um, the division of the letters, the division of the vowels and the consonants. He makes one other, one other note that, that I think is important. Let me, let me get into it. Um, what he teaches us, and maybe I should just erase this. <clears throat> Let me just erase this here. I'll erase the vowels. One last lesson he covers in this section. He tells us that any time the letter gamma is doubled in a word. And I'll give you an example. Here you see the letter gamma is doubled. He tells us that any time the consonant gamma is doubled, the first gamma is pronounced like the consonant nu. So rather than ag ge los, it's not ag ge los, it's an ge los. An ge los. And that's where we get the Latin angelus from angelos, even though in Greek it's not written with a nu, it's written with two gammas. But it's pronounced as angelos, angelos. So we learn in this lesson that when we have a double gamma, the first gamma is read as a nu. So this would not be pronounced angelos, but angelos. And he tells us the same is done um, when gamma is followed by some other consonants. <clears throat> Just make sure I cover everything that he does. Yeah. Um, so the same thing that's true of the double gamma can also be true of gamma followed by xi and gamma followed by ki. Same thing is true. In each of those pairs, that first gamma will be pronounced like an N. Okay? Just an orthographical lesson, a pronunciation lesson from classical Greek. Okay? So, that covers everything that... Uh, needs to be explained with regard to the division and the properties of the vowels and consonants. I know that's a lot of information crammed into a relatively short video. We're at 49 minutes right now. Um, the reason why I'm cramming a lot into a video is because you control the video. You can go back, watch it over as many times as you like, pause and start, back up and replay. Uh, you have control over that, so I don't have to worry about reviewing things and slowing things down. I leave that to you. But we've covered everything that Jacob Gretzer explains in his old Greek grammar book. Um, in the text lesson, you'll find uh, all of this text, all of the translation, all of these examples and everything. Uh, so you can study it all carefully for mastery. There will also be some more notes and details in the printed lesson. Uh, since this video, I just want to make sure we cover all the basics and then in the text lesson I can make sure I really get into the details 
and and provide you with all of the uh, um, all of the content that that Gretzer gets into. Uh, but I think what we've gone over in the video will be all that you really need to now study the text lesson and be able to study it for mastery, which is the goal of your study. So, if there's anything that I've discussed that was unclear or that you would like to have explained a little bit more, just get in touch with me and let me know. I'd be happy to do that. Um, make sure you study the text lesson for mastery. And as you get into the assessments for this lesson, make sure you remember that the assessments are always based on the content of your text lesson. The videos are intended to be helpful, uh, to, to help you avoid mistakes or confusion as you study, but your, your studying and the mastery that you seek in your studies will always be based on the actual printable lesson for the course, and all assessments will be, be, will be based on the content of those printable lessons. So I hope that's a helpful walk through this teaching on the division of the Greek letters. And like I said, if you have any questions or if anything's uncertain, please get in touch. I'd be happy to help you with these things. Because like I said, these issues are not just hair-splitting scholarly nonsense. These orthography issues affect the grammar rules that we're going to be learning in the future. They are important if we understand them rightly. I hope that helps. God bless your studies.